is uh, in his office in Virginia. And one of my colleagues from IDEA is gonna be handling chat and any other technical things we need as we go along. And she's actually in Rome, Italy. So, ciao, Tara. Ciao, ciao <laughs> from Italy. And hello, Michael. Hello, welcome everyone. All right, so uh, one other thing before we get into it, uh, feel free to ask questions at any time in the chat window. If you don't see the chat window, you click the little icon that you should see at the bottom of your screen and that will open up that. We are going to uh, wait until the end of the time since we have such a brief period of time. We're not gonna answer questions as we go, but we will stay and answer questions as long as we need to uh, at the end. So, but if you want to ask questions as we go, that's fine. <clears throat> Tara will kind of collect them and ask them again later, or you can wait until the end to ask a question either way. So let's get into it. Does the syllabus matter? You know, the syllabus is a required document. It's necessary. It's something we're all familiar with. It typically has course requirements in it, um, maybe policies that are required or that you've come up with. It's something that for a lot of faculty, we don't put a whole lot of thought in and we don't care that much about it. And if you if, can imagine, if that's our feeling about the syllabus, you can imagine uh, what students might think about it. So it's from the student point of view though, we, we it's another level here. It's often full of legalese kinds of demands and commands and, and rules. Uh, very often the language in the syllabus is also in jargon of, academics that that students are not yet familiar with and so they sometimes they literally don't understand what it's saying but even when they do it's not written in a style that appeals to them and draws them into the course but as one student said to me a while back it's the first thing i see and that's the first information i really get about the class before i go in and the point he was making is this is the first impression I'm getting of the class and of you as an instructor. And this is especially true if syllabi are available at your institution um, online or in some way where students can get them before classes begin, which is a good idea. Um, so my question for you is why would you not want to use this first impression document to motivate students about your class, to make them think it's gonna be interesting, get them excited about taking it, and give them a good impression of you. I've heard some people refer to this syllabus as sort of a first advertisement for a class, but certainly the standard syllabus is not much of an advertisement, not in its language, not in its appearance, not really even in the meaning. So one of the places to start making your syllabus more learner-centered is to simply consider the language of the document. Michael? If you look in the literature, you'll find three main purposes for syllabi. Um, maybe the most common one and the one that maybe you and students are most familiar with is one we might call a contract. Um, this is a, a document that does take on some legalese to it, although um, court cases have shown it doesn't necessarily always stand up in law, um, but it's, it's primarily there for the instructor to record content that they're gonna to cover to document when tests and assignments are gonna be and lay out policies and rules and expectations for the course. There's another step up which um, would, another purpose which would be for communication which has similar tone to the contract, um, similar purpose, it's about giving students information but, but it's written in ways that it's more user friendly for a student um, it's, it's less demanding, less policy driven than a contract. The third purpose, um, which we'll focus on today, is this invitational purpose, um, sometimes called a learning focused or learner centered um, syllabus. And this is, is definitely for the student. It lays out what students are expected to learn in the course or what you hope they will learn the ways that you and the students will know that um, that learnings happen and also lay out what it means in terms of the types of practice they're going to get to be successful. Um, as the name implies, invitational, there's a promise to it. This is language that Ken Bain, who wrote What the Best College Teachers Do, um, kind of coined. Um, there's a promise, there's an aspirational tone to it. And so it, it takes on a very different feel from what you might traditionally see in that contract um, syllabus. 
So if you look at um, some of the language that shows up in these two different documents, you can readily see the difference. So if you look at some of the language in the contract focus, you'll see things that um, are impersonal. Um, it's often written in third person by the end of the course students. These arbitrary students that you don't know will do, do certain things. There's lots of policies in there that students must do this and, and all sorts of ways that are penalized when they don't. Now, if you contrast that to the invitational syllabus, you get something that is obviously um, uh, much more personal. So it um, invites them into opportunities. It tries to give them agency and autonomy in what they learn, um, what they're gonna explore, maybe what they're gonna wonder about. And it's really about what they can do, um, how they're gonna earn certain things and, and how, they, um, how they might engage in the course in meaningful ways. But Michael, this softer approach to the language of the syllabus, does that mean that we don't have policies, that we don't tell them, you know, due dates and that you can't cheat and that sort of thing? Well, certainly, both syllabi are, are useful in terms of laying out the expectations, uh, obviously, for assignments and dates. You know, students need to know those things. So both of them serve that communicative um, uh, purpose. But the difference is, in, is how that's conveyed. Um, and in an invitational one, while you may have policies and expectations, they're framed in a way that helps the learner understand why those policies and expectations will help them learn. So, for example, if you do have uh, uh, a late policy, you might frame that in terms of how that late, how late work actually impedes the learning of the student as well as the other students in the classroom. You also sometimes, you often find in invitational syllabi a... Um, those policies and expectations framed within disciplinary conventions. For example, it's a good idea to have a policy around plagiarism. In an invitational syllabi, you might frame that in terms of um, how the discipline thinks about it and how um, plagiarism and things like that go against the integrity of the field. And so you just frame those a little differently as opposed do in a contractual syllabus, I might say something as simple as cheating will not be allowed. Well, what does cheating mean? And, and in what cases, when you, when you bend those rules, when you run into the gray area, is it actually supporting your learning and how do we navigate that together? Thank you. So uh, Michael mentioned Ken Bain. This is one of the things he said in the, what the best college teachers do, the trust and rejection of power, among other things like authentic goals, are apparent in the kind of syllabus the best teachers tended to use. So after considering the tone of the language, how you've worded things and, and the tone behind it, another simple change is just helping students grasp what your course is about and motivating them. So ask yourself, is there a single compelling message that describes the course that I can communicate to students that boils down the course to a single message that makes sense, it's accurate, but it also arouses interest. If you want, you can kind of think about this as advertising taglines, like this one from Subway, just two words, but it communicates so much about what Subway is about and what they want you to think about their food. Now, if you don't like that uh, advertising approach to it, that's fine. That's just one way of thinking about it. But what, what is the central message? What is the, the boiled down to? What is your course about? Here are um, three from three different kinds of courses you can see on the screen. And let's take uh, that first one as an example about st statistics. And here it is in the syllabus. So we see it right at the top of the syllabus. This is what this course is about. And it's followed by a couple of questions. How can you convince others to see things your way? How can you know the arguments others are making are based on truth? Those are really interesting questions to a lot of students. And the answer is right there by understanding how to use interpret data. In other words, <laughs> how to uh, take this course is how you answer those questions. Um, and that's there to grab students' uh, at attention and focus into what the course is about right away. But it's also can be used as an organizing mechanism for the entire class. So as this statistics class goes along, the instructor can be constantly asking these kinds of questions. Is this, is this data convincing? How, how might you change this data to make it more convincing to influence somebody? So it's not just something you use once, but it's going to be something that you'll be using uh, throughout the semester. I recently taught a course called Youth and Technology, 
Uh, and I organized the entire class around three questions that you see here. Uh, how do youth use technology? How does it affect them? And how do we create positive outcomes? I did this not so much as a effort of being a great course designer, but at kind of at a necessity. This course hadn't been taught before. There's no textbook for, for it. The field, the literature is still emerging. So I had to come up with a way of organizing what we were doing in the course. And this actually worked beautifully. I uh, use these three uh, big questions, big broad questions, to explain what we were doing and why. And I, as you see on the screen, I told them what they would be doing uh, to answer those questions as students in this class. And it, it worked beautifully as an organizing tool for the class. Students understood we were, where we were and where we were going and why we were doing certain things. But I would, do want to point out to you that these questions that I have that you see here are not necessarily um, big, intriguing questions that we might ask. I'll take these a step further. I could have asked something like this. How can some of you stand to sit for hours and hours playing video games? And can being highly connected to others through social media actually make you lonelier? You see how these are more compelling, big questions. Um, that this class could have answered. Uh, Michael, you wanna add anything to that? Yeah, I'll just build a little bit on that. Um, those of you that are familiar with Ken Bain's work, he, he frames these in terms of beautiful questions. What are those intriguing, provocative, awe-inspiring, maybe unanswerable questions that might hook the students long enough to um, engage and um, discover the value in your course? And if you've read his book, he describes the, a course that um, Melissa Harris Lacewell wrote or developed. Um, she was a political, um, a politics professor, and it was about the time um, that Hurricane Katrina hit, and she was teaching a course on Civil War Reconstruction. And so she designed the entire course around the question, how did Hurricane Katrina happen? In other words, how did an American city almost um, uh, get, get wiped off the, the face of the United States through this, this hurricane. And she traced that back and back to Reconstruction and that became the driving force of, of the course. Um, if you're interested in this, obviously Bain's a good place to look at, but also um, Hansen has a good book on, on big ideas. Again, how do you frame your course in, in questions and, and things worth um, spending time learning and, and engaging in? And your course does answer a big, beautiful question. You just may not know what it is off the top of your head, but every, every course does. I, I think that's a good, uh, good, good point, David. And that's simply because, you know, at the heart of all of our disciplines are beautiful questions. The original pursuit of that knowledge was around a beautiful question. Sometimes we have to remind ourselves, but certainly it's worth um, engaging students in those questions. We're gonna shift a little bit here. Um, we talked about one way to, to uh, change up your syllabus, make it more invitational through this big question or big idea. We're gonna talk now a little bit about transparency. Some of you may be familiar with Marianne Winklemus' work on transparent assignment design, um, where the idea is um, explicitly stating the whys and hows of assignments have all of these added benefits. Well, you can um, frame a syllabus in terms of transparency. And when you do that, you start to define what students will learn and why, how they will learn it, um, and how we both will know that the students learned it. And so while we often think about these in terms of the design of the course, we don't often articulate it in the syllabus. And there's opportunity there. So what, is, what does transparency mean in terms of a syllabus? Well, when we look at the syllabus, um, obviously spending a little time defining what the goals of the course are, and the goals are these long ranging three to five years after the course is over, here's what you might be able to do, know or value. Um, and really articulating what are those objectives, what are the things students should be able to do by the end of the course. Spending a little time not just saying here's how you will be uh, tested or assessed, but actually explaining why those assessments matter and how students, how those assessments will help students learn those objectives. Spending a little bit of time on learning activities, giving a sense of giving students a sense of what the class will be like. Um, is it going to be lecture? Is it going to be case studies? Is there going to be ethno ethnographic work in it? Um, what is the course going to be so that they have an expectation before the class even starts about how they might engage in that class? And obviously, there's opportunities in that document to begin to create the learning environment. So what kind of language do you use? Um, what kind of tone do you use? 
um, how do you convey the sense that you're going to help support students in their learning? I think David has some examples of what this looks like. All right, so once the course is well designed, uh, the idea is now you need to communicate that to students in a way that they can understand and that they will actually read and make sense of. And you can do that certainly with traditional text, but it can also be enhanced uh, by simple techniques. So here's an example from a child development course. Notice up at the top is the main theme of the course, that children grow through predictable stages that come with recognizable characteristics. And we're going to be studying three age groups. And in each age group, you are going to describe the stages of physical, cognitive, social, and emotional development. So there's the entire course laid out in one chart. It helps students get a real grasp of uh, what we're doing and why and how all these things fit together and, and where we'll be going chronologically through the course. Um, but this particular example is not completely transparent as Michael was just describing because we don't see here exactly what I'm going to be doing, how I'm going to be learning. We can do that though in simple ways. You see here a, a very simple table that lists the learning outcome, the assessments that are going to be assessing that particular learning outcome and the specific learning activities that we're going to be participating in in order to learn that outcome. So that's one way to do that. We can take this even farther, further by, you see here, it's graphically a little bit more interesting. Each element is kind of separated out in its own box. We've got some little arrows. It's just easy to understand what's going on. But the big change here is the change in the titles of the categories. Instead of learning assessments, we have what you will learn, how you will learn this, and how, how I'll know you learned it. Notice how accessible that language is, especially for people who may uh, be new, new students, but it's uh, a much more acceptable or accessible kind of a language. Now we can take this idea even further, and you see here now we've color coded them. So our learning outcomes are in green, our assessments are in, in blue and so forth. And we've added a fourth column to this to make this uh, completely transparent when you'll do all of these things. So we, we know what, how, how I know you learned it and when you'll do all of this all in one place, making it uh, understandable as well as visually appealing and easy to read. And I'll, I'll just add in one more opportunity here. Um, it's nice that on the, the, the left hand side there you have the learning objective. There's also an opportunity here to think about what is the question underlying um, this objective. In other words, why would students care to learn to do this? So it's another opportunity to pull in those beautiful questions to say, by the end of this, you'll be able to answer these types of questions. Excellent, All right. So we can take visual uh, ideas even further here. Here's an example from Curtis Newbold. He takes sort of an infographic approach to building the syllabus. Um, which as you can see is visually very appealing, but it also organizes the content of the syllabus into sections that are very understandable. I can find them easily. I understand exactly what they're telling me. Uh, I particularly like the pie chart here where uh, the grades are, are laid out on this particular syllabus. Here's an example of another one that uses the idea of big ideas. There are three of them as you see in this class and for each big idea, there are subtopics that we're gonna be talking about. So this is a good time to point out that you don't do this with the syllabus just for use on the first day or for students to read ahead of time, but you're gonna be using this throughout the semester. So in this example, as we move in the course from big idea one to big idea two, I'm gonna ask students to pull out their syllabus or I'm gonna put this image up on the screen and say, okay, we've done this, now we're moving on to this next session and this is why and this is how all this fits together. Together. So even if you're not, you don't think you're capable of doing something graphically like this, I just want to point out that there, there are simple templates and things like Word that make it pretty easy for you to uh, put a more visual syllabus together. Uh, remember my course with three questions. This is my infographic version of that syllabus. Notice the three questions there along with what students will do. I do want to point out that that is a school color on the background there. I normally <laughs> would not have chosen <coughs> color quite that loud, but I figured it was appropriate. Um, so 
if you don't think that you have the, the skills, the graphic skills to do this sort of thing, that's okay. Let me remind you of a couple of things. There may be students on your campus in communications or graphic design programs that would love to tackle your syllabus. So I would encourage you to look into that possibility. You might be lucky and have a, an administrative assistant or a student assistant in your department that might also take it on. But if you want to do it yourself, there are lots of ways of doing it. This particular one was done with a service called pictochart.com uh, through a free version of it. And there are many others out there, but uh, you can easily do drag and drop creation of these kind of visual syllabi. So looking back at the original question, if you do all of these kind of things, does it make any difference? Does it, Michael? Well, it, it does. I'll just give the answer right away. It does. I'm going to come back to what David just talked about, these graphic syllabi. You may say, wow, that's going to take me a long time to, to make. Um, I'm not sure if it makes a difference. Um, there's a little bit of research out on graphic syllabi. Um, Moody and coworkers just a couple years ago, they created two syllabi for the same course, one that was text-based and one that had graphical elements in it. And what they found through surveying students was that students found in the graphic-based syllabus that they were more interested in the course and in, the, in, and in taking that course from the instructor. So in a small way, even adding graphic elements helped. Um, in some private communication with some colleagues um, at another institution, they've been doing some, some really interesting research of tracking students' eye movement when they read syllabi. And one thing they've noticed is when they're reading uh, syllabi that have graphic elements, their eyes tend to linger longer in each section. So whether that um, translates to better understanding of the document, it's hard to tell, but at least they're spending more time with it. There have been some other studies out there um, that, that say that the document matters. Um, some early studies um, that looked at tone and does the tone matter and when when the tone is more inviting and more personal, you're using personal pronouns. What they found is students believe that that structure is going to be more approachable and more helpful in their learning. Um, there are also some other research out there that actually looks at well, what things do students attend to and so forth. Um, probably no surprises there. We did some work at the University of Virginia that um, we hope has helped move this research along quite a bit. Um, we have a tool, a, a syllabus rubric that allows us to score syllabus, uh, syllabi on that continuum from uh, content focused or, or a contract clear out to the invitational. And so we can get a quantitative score on that. And so what we did is we took a, a US history course, an introductory history course, and we created two syllabi, trying to keep as much consistent between those two as possible. But one of them was on a scale of zero to 46, one scored under five, that's the contract one. The other one is scored above 40, that's the invitational one. And then we asked students, what do you think about um, the document itself, about the instructor and about the course? And so what you see here um, are those results. And that is that the invitational syllabus wins in, in every category. Students are, are, have more positive perceptions of that document, um, the course and the instructor. And you can see the, the interesting things they say about it. It's a useful organizing document. Um, it's the course itself looks like it's interesting, relevant, rigorous learning experience. And then the instructor cares about them. One of the things we looked at in, that, um, in, that, in this study was, does the length of the document matter? And certainly as you create an invitational syllabus, it gets longer and longer. Um, and so we thought, well, maybe students wouldn't read it. So what students say about the length is, yes, it's long, but it's helpful. And there was another recent study that, that just came out that essentially came to the same conclusion. Um, what they found was that when that, um, when that syllabus is longer, they feel like the instructor cares more about them since they're willing to take that, that information. So one of the other take homes of, of that is how do you actually help students read that document and how do you make sure they're coming back to it over the course of the semester? I did, before we move on, I wanted to show you a little bit of the qualitative data. So we asked students about the instructor when they read that contract um, uh, type of syllabus. These are things they say. Remember, they haven't, haven't met the instructor, they haven't gone to the course, they're just inferring this from the document. So when you take a contract approach, um, it, I'm, I'm guessing you don't want your students to be thinking this about you. When you have that invitational one, you get very different um, experience or, or responses. So yes, the instructor seems to expect a lot from the students, but you know, this instructor is gonna help them um, uh, be successful in that course, that they care about um, learning and not just memorizing. 
the interesting thing is students also infer things about what they're going to learn and how they're going to learn it. So in a contract focused syllabus, they recognize that, or at least they think what's going to happen is that they're going to sit there um, listening to lectures the whole time. But when you take time to be transparent about what you're going to do and really ar articulate well what the assessments are and, the, and some of the learning activities, students get a very different impression. I think you'd all be happy if students recognized that your course was to help them develop some personal, you know, fill in the disciplinary type of thinking. Um, I think that would be valuable. Again, they're getting all this from the document. And so you, you begin to ask yourself, um, well, I think what you recognize is that th that document is influencing students' motivation one way or another. That contract has a, a negative motivating factor, whereas the invitation actually has some positive aspects. So before the student ever walks into your door, you can actually set them up for success and yourself up for success. So to summarize kind of the major points that we've been talking about here, ask yourself, is your syllabus, first of all, a contract or more like an invitation? The invitation that has clear, accessible language, it has an inviting tone, it's not overly authoritarian in, in the tone that's behind it. Uh, is it compelling and motivating? Is there, are there things like a, a central theme like you see here? Can poverty ever be eliminated? Um, are there interesting visual elements to it? Uh, you can go all the way with a very graphical syllabus or at least is it organized in a way that's easy to read and you're taking advantage of basic tools you have for uh, communicating information? And then finally, is it transparent? Is it clear what, why, and how they'll learn and, and be assessed? And Remember that there are other ways that you can make courses interesting, gamification and the whole design of the course. What we've been talking about today is not actually designing a course, but designing a syllabus. But the design of the course has a major impact on the syllabus. You cannot, Michael, I think you'll back me up on this, you cannot take a really poorly designed course and come up with a great syllabus and have a winning course because of the syllabus, right? Yeah, I think I would agree with that. Um, Ideally, you know, you've spent some time really thinking about the design, thinking about your, your goals and objectives, aligning all of your assignments and activities to those, um, to those objectives. And then the syllabus is ideally just an, an accurate articulation of that design. And so making things we often um, make implicit to students that, that are in our heads explicit and put it on that document. Awesome. Thank you. So we're at the end of our time here. I want to tell you a couple of things before we go and take questions. We have on our uh, website a podcast, our Sound Idea podcast, on the topic of syllabi called The Lowly Syllabus. It's 17 minutes long. I would encourage you to check it out. And Tara, if you would post the link to that in the chat window, that will take you right to that page. Also on that page, are links to some examples of syllabi, links to Michael's work at the University of Virginia that uh, I would encourage you to check out. I will also follow up uh, the webinar for those of you who are registered with an email with a link to that information as well as a few other things. <clears throat> and if you are a faculty developer, I would encourage you to look out for the link to a workshop plan that's just come out for uh, leading faculty through a workshop on syllabi design and redesign. So uh, at the bottom of the hour, we're glad to stay and take questions from anybody. Tara, do we have anything? Um, almost all the questions are about whether you can share those great slides. Everybody wants the slides. Okay, I will uh, let me think about if there's anything in there that I can't share, but I will be glad to do that or communicate with you in the email about that later. We will have a recording of this that I'll send to you in the uh, email that you'll get from me shortly. I have a question about the workshop plan. I see that will be in the uh, email that you'll get, if assuming you're registered. If not, um, if you will email me, simply david at ideaedu.org. You see the uh, URL on the screen there. Um, be glad to send it to you. Other questions about uh, your syllabi? or about, about this whole idea of a learner-centered syllabus. Uh, a question came in saying, could you offer a brief bibliography for this, um, uh, your favorite two or three books you would recommend? 
Well, we have some of that on our uh, podcast webpage, but yeah, I'll get with uh, Michael and we'll put a few more things together for you. Thanks for that, Ken. Yeah, I can, I can say a few things. There's a great book um, called The Course Syllabus. Um, I don't remember all the authors, so I'm not gonna name them right now. I think you can find it pretty quickly. There's a brand new book that came out that called, was called Designing a Motivational Syllabus, which I think is aligned really well with um, what uh, David and I were talking about today. Um, I know these, I know the authors, but I, I, I don't get any royalties off of this, but um, Christine Harrington and Melissa Thomas are the, the authors, but it's really well done and will provide a, a much more detailed road, roadmap about how to create this invitational syllabus. And um, one person wants to know if you have, uh, have heard of the book called Teaching Through the Rhythms of the Semester. It sounds vaguely familiar to me, but I'm not familiar with it enough to comment. Michael, do you know it? Yeah, actually, I don't. I'm going to have to check it out. Great. And Tracy wants to know if um, that, that some of her faculty have stated that they want at least portions of their syllabus contractual. Can you comment on that? I'll, I'll take a, a first stab. Um, it depends on what they mean by contractual. I mean, obviously, it's good to lay out expectations, policies, or certain things you want in there, um, statements around diverse, diversity, inclusivity, um, those types of things. What we recommend here at Virginia, and we work with um, almost a thousand faculty in redesigning courses, is think about the syllabus as the place where you keep things about learning. If it's not about learning, if it's more of a policy, think about putting it in a different document and, and labeling it as such. And so you might put some of those policies, more contractual types of things in a policy document. Now, this might be controversial to some, but that also, that, that even includes things like grading schemes, because grading schemes are are um, a policy, whereas information about assessment, how students are gonna know whether they're learning, that's about learning. So that would go in the syllabus. Um, and so, you know, if you can't separate the two documents, some people find it helpful to put the things that are less important to them toward the end of the document. Remember, students may not read the whole thing right away. So if you put a lot of policies and rules up front, that might be the only thing students read and they're missing out on those beautiful questions. And it doesn't necessarily, Michael, have to be in a separate document. From what I've seen, you could have the learner-centered stuff up front and then the policies just as a separate section at the back so that at least there's this clear separation between the two. Absolutely. I think thinking of it as, even if it's one document, thinking about it as two sections that are, have different focus. I don't have any more questions here for showing up. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for being here. We hope this was a useful half hour or so of your time. Again, you'll be, if you registered for, for this, I assume you did since you're here, uh, you'll be getting an email from me shortly. But uh, thank you very much. Hope everybody has a great academic year and things get off to a good start for you soon. Yeah, thank good you. luck, everybody. Um, feel free to, to follow up if you have any questions and good luck with the start of your semester.